Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul and we are going to be discussing the Xbox Scorpio again, but from a very different angle than previously. This is not going to focus on the performance of the console, at least traditionally. Instead, we're going to focus on Microsoft's, well, plans to launch a console last year. Yep, that's right. They were planning to launch a more powerful Xbox last year. No, not the Xbox One S. Instead, something entirely different. I guess you could say it was Scorpio's little brother that never lived. So, this was an interview with Gamma Sutra. And it's a very interesting interview. I'll make sure to link it in the video description. And I'll read out a couple of comments from the Xbox boss, Phil Spencer. He said, and I quote, We designed a console for 2016 and a console for 2017. We were kind of working on both plans simultaneously. I think we just need to do something more than what the silicon's available at 2016 at a price point that the customer would actually want to pay for. So they just stopped and we said, okay, well, we're going to put all of our weight and execution capability of the hardware team behind delivering a higher power console in 2017 that's completely geared towards 4K. Now, why is that? Why did they stop it? Why, why did they say to themselves at that point, this isn't working? Well, it's quite simple. Basically, Phil and his team had a vision. They had a dream and it was 4K. Basically, what they said to themselves is, what is the Xbox One capable of doing? So, for example, 1080p, 30fps. We want to replicate that exactly the same, at least that number of uh, frames per second, but they wanted to do so at higher visual quality, 4K. And what they found was that the hardware just was not capable of doing it in 2016, at least at a price point or without tricks such as, you know, temporal resolution or upscaling or whatever, that was at a price point a customer could afford. So he said, um, we just didn't think we could make that promise to developers in 2016, and I just didn't think we could get there last year with the silicon that was on the market. Now, he did touch briefly upon the PlayStation 4 Pro, which is obviously a bit of a sore point, so he doesn't really want to just, you know, badmouth Sony, but he said, sometimes... I get in trouble when I talk about Sony too much. Ah, Phil, you're not the only one. But the choice they made on the PS4 Pro, I totally get that choice. From their perspective and what they wanted to do, they've built a good 2016 PS4 Pro. I found those very off topic. I find that wording quite interesting. They found that they built a good 2016 PS4 Pro. That's quite interesting choice of words. I wonder if Phil knows something we don't. Probably. Um, anyway, when the silicon with the silicon that was available, they picked up the parts and they made good sense to go and they put a console together in 2016. And he says, I'm strongly a believer in a console and that that's what appliance means in a family room under my TV. The planning for what happens after Scorpio in the console space is already underway. You have to think about it like this, like what's the next thing? We, I, remain committed to the console space. We think it's critically important. So what does that mean? Well, it also means that Scorpio is not the end of the road. I know, you're shocked. You, you, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a minute because you're probably recoiling from the, the terror of realising that Microsoft are not stopping the development of new consoles. But seriously, like, I think we all knew that the Xbox, what, two? Xbox All-Inclusive? The Xbox that can play Gears of War 5? That 100 edition? I don't know what the hell they're going to call it. But still, um, it's not really surprising they've done this. And I think it's a good thing. I mean, honestly, I'm happy they didn't release the system at that point. Phil basically believes that the original Xbox, which of course, you know, was pretty much their first foray into consoles. I say pretty much because there was the Dreamcast with the operating system, which obviously was, you know, not exactly them producing the hardware. They were originally planning to buy out Sega, as some people know, but that just didn't happen. Bill Gates didn't believe Sega, uh, Sega had enough uh, market clout at that point to be possible, and you know he wasn't 100% confident. Uh, then Sega kind of threw a loophole in as well. They said that they wanted, you know, for them to continue uh, supporting the Dreamcast online, and basically the negotiations fell through. Um, but uh, yeah, so the original Xbox was SD, standard definition, so in other words, 40, 480p. Some people are going to comment, but dude, some games are 720. Well, yes, they were, but let's face it, it wasn't the predominant resolution of the system. Uh, there were some games, of course, that 
even ran in progressive scan, by the way, oh, and rather nicely on the original Xbox. The 360 was a high-definition console, so 720p. Some games did run at 1080, but the predominant amounts ran at 720p or below. Um, and then, of course, they considered the Xbox One to be like 900 or 1080p, but what they say is that they saw HD TVs, uh, sorry, full uh, 4K TVs happening. It was kind of like... It, <laughs> And I've said this before, I believe it was like before the consoles were even released, maybe even 2014, 2013, possibly just after they were released. Because there were a lot of uh, concerns for Microsoft and the PlayStation 4 that they weren't powerful enough to run like 1080p 60. And I said it then, I, I, you know, I stand by it, it wasn't Sony or Microsoft's fault, it just kind of was how the technology was at the time. You know, there wasn't a transition to 16-14nm um process the cpu technology well there wasn't the new ones out at the time you were still on the older gcn architecture the price point was still pretty expensive you know gddr5 memory was still kind of high in terms of the price and the capacity per dim was quite low don't forget there was a reason that if you even look at some of the leaks even now if you go onto like playstation if you go to google and type in ps4 a memory diagram a lot of them will show leaks or the the various buses they'll show the leaks showing four gigabytes for the ps4 the original ps4 and there's a reason behind that even till basically just before the system was announced even developers thought sony were packing in four gigabytes of ram into the system and what happened is of course i wouldn't say last minute but sony were just like we're gonna make the the leap to have eight gigs in the system and it was a bit of a gamble, because what could have happened is they didn't get enough, um, basically enough enough uh, memory modules. And it would have either increased the cost of the console, which would have obviously eaten quite significantly into Sony's profit margins, or it would have meant that producing the console would have been, well, tricky. Because they wouldn't have actually had enough memory to meet the demand. So they would have had enough custom, say, chips. They would have had the hard drive. They had the case. They had the power supplies and all the other bits. But it doesn't work so well without the memory. And that's the reason, predominantly, Microsoft went with DDR3. Because they wanted 8 gigabytes of RAM in the system. Because they also consider, of course, overheads with, like, Connect. And, you know, the sharing stuff. And TV and all this crap. And I don't mean that in a nice way, crap. And basically, they just thought to themselves, eh, we need 8 gigabytes minimum, so what can we do? And that's why they went with the ES RAM. So, a bit of a backstory, just in case you didn't know. And, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. And what's even further interesting is Phil has been working on this, Scorpio, essentially, with the roadmap anyway, for about three years, according to Gamma Sutra. That's really cool. So basically, they know what's you know been coming along, which isn't surprising to me. They didn't just cobble this together two days ago. Let's just be totally honest. And this is um, a promise they've been making to developers. Now, one thing I do want to clarify, and this is according to Phil himself. First of all, if you own an Xbox game that was on on release, let's say Rise, Son of Rome, and you put it into your you know, Scorpio, which, you know, let's say you buy one, day one. There doesn't have to be a patch. There doesn't have to be anything specific that happens. The game will run. But, and this is the key thing, there is no need for a developer to support, technically, the Scorpio. So, in other words, what they're going to be doing is they are going to instead incentivize developers by saying, yes, we're not mandating people do Scorpio-specific work, but... If you're a AAA studio, being realistic, most of them have PC targets. So what they believe is that if they empower developers by providing them the correct tools via DirectX and PIX and all that uh, middleware, what you can get is all for the game on, 4, on 4K for your PC, and then you've got those assets already. What I mean by the assets is, if you're creating a game, let's just take textures as a nice example. If you're creating textures... If you create the game in, let's say, 1080p target, and then you upscale, those textures are still going to be offered quite often in, well, 1080p. But if you offer them in, 10K, in 4K, and then you can downscale them appropriately. So, in other words, you can simply just release different versions of those assets depending on the game, level of detail, whatever the graphics settings are. So, what they're hoping is for developers now, 
obviously a lot of developers, uh, and although Phil didn't say it, a lot of Western developers are primarily supporting the Xbox. Japanese developers, eh, some aren't, but even I think it's going to become more popular. Well, let's just be honest. If you're offering a game for the PC, which is becoming more popular in Japan or whatever, you're probably going to be creating the game with high resolution assets in mind. Therefore, Microsoft are hoping that essentially you can then, well, port that to the Xbox Scorpio. And I'm quite happy with that. Now, the only issue with it, to be honest, is that obviously that does in theory mean that you could have a situation where certain games don't take advantage of the Scorpio. So in short, if, for example, a studio decides, hey, I'm not going to take advantage of the Scorpio hardware, the game is going to look identical to your friend Billy, who does not have a Scorpio, you know, he's going to have an Xbox One. The other thing, and I want to clarify this as well, if you are Billy and you're concerned that, you know, the Scorpio suddenly won't, um, you know, is going to crush and monopolize the Xbox and basically you're going to be no longer able to play games, Phil says that no, this isn't the case. He believes that the Xbox is one is a family of devices. So in short, you're going to have to support the original Xbox, the S and the Scorpio. Of course, you don't have to do the Scorpio specific uh, tweaks. So it's going to be a little bit like a PC. It's going to be like, okay, well, yeah, you have the minimum to play the game, but you also got the maximum to play the game, if you will. So it's going to be interesting to see how Phil's take and how Phil's plans do. Anyway, with all of that said, take care of yourselves. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, subscribe, you know, give me internet cookies. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.